welcome to Galaxy Brains. The weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. I'm back with another rap and I never be smirch. See, I gotta keep it real because you know that's the best. We got a guest from CMS named Dan Machashevsky. As always, I'm your host, Alex Thorne, head of Firmwide Research at Galaxy Digital. And as I said, we have Dan Machashevsky from CMS Holdings as a guest on today's podcast. And gosh, it's a great conversation. He's one of the longest market participants in crypto. We'll talk with Dan about FTX, Alameda, Tether, uh, bankruptcy, market cycles, and some of his favorite and cringiest moments in crypto history. We'll also check in with Bimnet Abibi. Even though he's not in studio today, he's going to be calling in. We never miss a market update from Bimnet. And Christine Kim and I will talk about a range of other crypto news happening this week, including Fidelity launching crypto for retail, BlockFi's bankruptcy, um, Casa adding Ethereum support to its multi-sig wallet, and more. But before we begin, please refer to the disclaimers on the podcast notes and note that none of the information in this podcast constitutes investment advice or recommendation, solicitation, or offer by Galaxy Digital or its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. Got that disclaimer out of the way, so let's get right into it. Let's go now to our friend Bimnet of BB from Galaxy Digital Trading. Bim, I mean, I guess the only, uh, I don't know if this is the only news, but one news item I saw today, Wednesday, November 30th, was that Jay Powell uh, seemed to confirm uh, 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 declining rate hikes uh, for next month. So I'm assuming that means 50 bips from the Fed and not 75? Correct. So right now the market's uh, thinking, baseline for, for the market is that you're going to get a 50 bit hike in, in December FOMC, uh, which is in, you know, I think uh, on December 14th. Um, I don't think it's, it's a material change versus, you know, what you had uh, from the, the Fed speakers you've had over the past couple of weeks, from what Powell said during last FOMC, you know, basically repeated himself. He said, you know, their expectation for where terminal rates are going to be are going to be slightly higher than where they said uh, they're going to be, according to their, their their summary of economic projections that were released in September. So basically, he was like, "Okay, the market's pricing in five percent. That's reasonable." And then he also, you know, discussed, um, you know, what what he's trying to balance right now, which is, you know, if if he starts easing too early or if he doesn't hike, um, you know, high enough. Uh, basically, if he doesn't perfectly get financial conditions, um, like. T- sufficiently tight for for like a long time he won't successfully have have, have brought inflation down to, to the fed's target so he's got a lot of things that that, that, that he's trying to do and he, he obviously has other policy tools including um the, the balance sheet and you know right now we're, we're engaging in a pretty you know material runoff of, of the balance sheet and that's likely to continue so you know the big questions that the market has is how high are you taking rates and how high are rate, how long are high rates going to be um, in effect? And right now, you know, Powell is, and the Fed are basically telling you that the risks of not keeping rates high for longer um, are um, too high. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 they're, they're trying to be as, you know, as hawkish as possible because you've got, you know, headline CPI still on a, on a crazy seven handle in a labor market that hasn't cracked yet. Right. Anything else? I mean, obviously the reaction on, I saw the markets were, were up. I mean, it looked like across the board yeah. risk was trading up, I guess, but to your point, just a confirmation of really what the market already thought uh, was going to happen. In no, absolutely. The, the market reaction, I, I think, is a, is a bit more of a function of, you know, what he didn't really address, which is, you know, you've had um, the stock market do incredibly well over, over the past couple of weeks. The S&P is, you know, at 4,000. You've had the dollar um, also sell off. You know, if you look at things like pounds or, or euros, you know, they've had material moves off the lows. Um, and you also had, you know, pretty material rally in, in the back end of, of the U.S. curve, you know, with, with, with tens of go- having gone from, you know, four handle to like, you know, through high 360s, low 370s. Um, and so, you know, the fact that he didn't really push back against that in a, in a very aggressive way versus like, you know, juxtapose that with how Powell reacted during the press conference during uh, last FOMC, when somebody told him stocks were rallying, he proceeded to list like a bunch of <laughs> you know super hawkish talking points. I remember that. And so the fact the fact that he's not pushing back as aggressively on on kind of uh, what the market has done recently, um, you know, I think is is what caused the the, the market to, to move higher. In addition, I think people w- were expecting him to be slightly more hawkish than what he was, and so markets viewing this favorably. Um, and 
And, you know, I think that the big thing in terms of, you know, how you have to think about it is that um, I think downside going into this meeting was, was very limited. Even if Powell was super hawkish, I don't think the market would have sold off that much because, one, you have um, lots of data coming up before next FOMC. So you've got the, the, the jobs report, which will be out on, on Friday. You've got, you know, another inflation number um, and, and other data points as well. But, you know, with, without getting like a clear sense of prices and jobs before, you know, like the, the, the market's not going to, you know, price in a super hawkish outcome, knowing that the risks, of the, you know, there, there's two way risk on, on you know, the, the economic data numbers and recent data has been turning soft. I mean, today we had the, the Chicago um, PMI um, survey come in, I believe, at 37.2. Uh, these are levels not seen since like the depth of COVID. So you there are pockets of material weakness in, in the U.S. economy. And so, you know, what you have to ask yourself is, you know, is more bad data and bad data that's accelerating going to cause the, the Fed to, to slow down? Um, or, you know, is the Fed going to stick to its sort of, you know, message, which, which has been fairly consistent, is that they're going to keep rates high for, for longer. So big thing for me is how on earth, you know, the, like, how, how, how is the Fed going to react to data um, if it slows down much more aggressively and, and much right. more quickly? Um, and I think, you know, I, you're going to get more dovish rhetoric and I'll be good for markets and stuff. Um, so it should be good. Yep. Awesome. Bimnet, a BB. We'll check in with you again next week. We've got more data coming um, and you'll be back in the studio with us. And so good luck, um, everyone. And thank you, Bimnet, as always. Pleasure. Let's go now to our guest, Dan Machashevsky from CMS Holdings. Great to have you here, Dan. Uh, thanks for coming, man. Good to be here. Good to be alive. <laughs> yeah, it is in this market. I mean, how how are you guys doing in general? How are you feeling? That's a, I mean, like, I'll say this. Like, it's getting rapidly harder to, like, operate. Um, like, we're losing venues quite quickly, like, lenders in particular. Um, but we're here. Like, we have... Like we're like we're definitely not in the shape we were to start the year, but like we're able to like operate, like we're able to keep like taking risk on. Um, so it's like good from that like side of view, but like really like structurally, it's becoming harder. Yeah. Um, like there's like there's like not a lot of venues left. Um, or there's there's rapidly declining yeah. options. So like that's that's just like made it a little bit harder. Yeah, true. I mean, the market infrastructure is going to look a lot different. Um, in a few years, or it already looks different now. I mean, actually, that's a good question. I mean, I I don't want to jump way too far ahead here, but since you mentioned that and the venues and and we look at the market infrastructure, you've been around in the markets a long time. It looks a lot different or it looked a lot different this last bull run than it did in 2017. Right. It wasn't just like the Poloniex troll box like anymore as like your as your main chat. Right. <laughs> like, um, right. how do you think it's going to look different? Like in, you know, three more years, three years from now. Oh, that's a good question. Um, three years is hard. I think like just in the short term, like there's a void here, right? Like there in particular, like in like derivatives venues, right? Like it's really just Binance left. Right. Like that's kinda it. Like there's OKX, like Hobie's going through Tron's transition, so I don't even know how that's gonna play out. But like and then you have CME, but like that doesn't really give you like a breadth of options. So I don't know. I do think if there was ever a window for one of the mid tier exchanges to like step up and become like bigger and like fill the void of that like that'd be good it, the, like the weird underbelly of this whole thing is like it's like just very hard as like a person with like us ubos to like operate on any mm -hmm. of these things ftx like was very much filling that niche for a lot of people um so maybe somebody takes on a little bit of like more regulatory sort of like risk and like fills that but like right now um it's like not clear like where that like order flow is necessarily going to go like binance is a clear winner but like i'm not sure that that like actually like holds yeah and also it's a lot of concentration risk right like binance is like i'm a Material like it was before it's even more so now like it's like a we have like a problem if something happens to that um there's no like real like redundancy i think like yeah. you still have coinbase and stuff but it's different like the real like liquidity in the market is like very much concentrating yeah i mean you're seeing i mean 60 plus percent of spot volumes it looks like on on finance let alone you're talking about derivatives and so perps right i mean is that the only game in town for perps right now and it's not the only game, but um, I mean, you still have Bybit, you still have OKX. Okay. Right. Like, there's there's like other venues. There's Darabit still. Um, it's just they're not. They have none of them has like stepped up to like sort of be that like second sort of yeah. spot yet. Maybe yeah. it's Bybit. Like maybe they like take the action on. Um, the, and also like the spot volumes are a little like wonky, right? Because like 
finance is like doing zero fee trading right. like that like sort of like messes with like stuff a little bit but either way like it's definitely the most liquid yeah. i don't think you can argue that and they're like fighting now to take over stable coin like volume right and like actual like issuance it's like they, that's like another concentration risk absolutely um, all right, let's let's go back a, a minute, bit for our listeners who may not know Dan. Um, first of all, definitely follow Dan on Twitter at CMS Holdings. I think one of the most entertaining and insightful accounts uh, on crypto Twitter. But Dan, um, CMS, you're you're a proprietary fund, right? You you, you take no outside capital. Um, tell us the story of CMS. Um, you know, I, and for our listeners, Dan, you used to used to run Circle Trade uh, at Circle. Um, which was back, I don't know exactly, maybe correct me on these time frames. we'll say 2017 and before, I think was the largest OTC dealer in crypto. Um, how did you go from there to CMS? Yeah, so I actually started Kraken, believe it or not. Oh, wow. um, I didn't know Way a long time ago. So then I, jo- I jo- yeah, that was like 2013, and then I joined Circle um, 2014. Um, and then that just didn't become a thing until like 2017. That right. was like when it was big, right? Like that, first, that was a real cycle where there was like liquidity needs. Um, so ran that through with Josh Lim, who I think works with you at Galaxy, though I don't remember right. if you guys overlapped. Um, and then did that for a while, did that basically up until mid 2019. And then teamed up with a guy named Bobby Cho at Cumberland, formerly, and a guy named Julian Sagan, who had actually worked with me at Circle, pulled our capital and decided to trade our own. Um, there was like a confluence of things going on. Like one was Circle was like in a really rough spot before USDC had like really caught a bid um and like become a thing like that like business was struggling massively um so the otc and trading desk was like unclear if like had a future um uh, mostly because like the capital like sort of needs of it and then um bobby was just like making a make a move from cumberland anyway and mm-hmm. we'd like known each other from trading forever i traded with bobby when he was at second market which was way way back um like 2013 2012, that, and that that, like, was a, what, what, that was a that was a dcg that was barry silbert's company right DCG didn't even exist. It was all second market. Right, so like right. before DCG even got like created, um, like the, the, they were all trading other stuff. Like the auction rate securities business was like big for them then. So because like they got started selling secondary of Facebook, like that was like right. Barry's bread and butter. And then on the back of that company started putting in language to basically restrict the ability to sell shares. So they were like, all right, like we need a new business. And then they looked at a bunch of random shit but crypto sort of stock and that was just Bitcoin. Like there was no other thing that they were trading. Um, right. And then they were doing these auction rate securities and like crypto business. And then eventually they just carved out crypto and we're like, all right, this is like clearly like a real business and like, we're going to grow that. But that's when DCG got started, but yep. it was like DCG wasn't a thing forever. So you and Bobby got together and, and, and Julian and, um, and created CMS and, and what, what do you guys do? I mean, we know that you're, you guys trade cryptos. What, what is in general, the, the funds overall strategy? Yeah. Well, right now it's like, make sure you don't die, <laughs> but like in general, like in like the good times, it's like, there's a couple of different things. Like the first one is like, we look at like shorter duration, sort of like trading, right? Like, why do we think inflows are going wherever? Like what, like, that's like a lot of like short-term directional, like taking, like we do take on a good amount of risk. Um, and then the other part of it is like the venture sort of stuff. That's like more like Bobby's wheelhouse. I sit more in like the liquid sort of side. Yep. And then we have a handful of people here who like try to run automated type strategies, a lot of like electronic space, like more like typical sort of like neutral, yep. like Delta neutral, like trading sort of yep. opportunities. Um, like that we don't do a ton of yet. We're doing more of it as time goes on. Um, like we did like a lot of like random stuff. Like we did some of the GBTC like rolling, like yep. basically like creation and selling. Um, we did some, like, we used to do a lot of like the basis trading, right. Just like rolling down futures. Um, so I don't know, like uh, kind of anything that we think that there is like edge in the market, like we try to like participate in and that's like sort of been the, um, background of it and it, it evolves, right? Like what you're doing yeah. in any like given period, like changes every six months. I, yeah. One of the things that I know you guys from, um, uh, which is kind of hilarious that you had mentioned Dan or the CMS Dan's Twitter. Mm -hmm. I know CMS first and foremost through the CMS intern Twitter account (laughs) because that account has like some of the dankest memes. It's always really active in all of the crypto discussions. Um, So thank you for that background on that. But I'm also really curious. I mean, um, what was kind of like the backstory around the CMS um, intern Twitter account and like Tell me a little bit about your your experience, like starting up those internships at CMS. Yeah, so Kevin worked for us. Um, so Kevin's a full time employee now, but he he got it was like I think it was must have been middle of 
like COVID, right? So like that first winter, um, he was at school and they basically kicked everybody out and they were like, all right, like oh, yeah. you have to leave because COVID, right? So he's like, well, I got a ton of time and I can't, nothing to do and I'm stuck at home locked in my house. And he had reached out um, through like a mutual friend who was like, hey, this guy's sharp. He like needs something to do. Like, are you interested? And he called me and we just like basically talked for like 10 minutes. And I was like, all right, like everything had gotten really busy too, right? Like this is when like the markets were starting to like really take off. And I was like, if you could just like start, like we'll give you like random like projects basically to like research. Like we just had like, we we were really understaffed at the time and like we really needed headcount anyway. So we, like, we're just like, all right, like we'll throw you in the fire. Like there'll be stuff to do. Um, did a great job over that period. He ended up going back to school, graduating. And then like we brought him on, but it was kind of his creation. He just like did it and then like kind of told us about it and we're like all right like i don't care like run with it um and then it became like a thing on its own um but that was really like all his like brainchild like we didn't tell him or direct him in any capacity he yeah just, i mean like, he, decided he, he takes like full scenes from movies and like overlays like people's faces and stuff it's amazing They're yeah good. he's gotten good at it yeah, yeah. <laughs> like people people try to like pay him to like make them for them <laughs> effectively like well they'll be like hey could you make one of this and put this in it. So yeah, he gets pitched <laughs> a lot. I don't I think he's taking anybody up on it. Well, glad that he's got a full-time job now is no longer just an intern. Uh, congrats to Kevin, uh, who I did actually get to meet a couple weeks ago for the first time. So, um, an awesome guy. So that, that, that has yeah, been, yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah. It's been a great part of your, of your, of the CMS story, but, um, here's another one, Dan, uh, some, before we get into some meteor topics, um, you know, it's on your Twitter bio. You're pretty well known for saying, do you want to be right? Or do you want to make, do you want to make money or do you want to be right? Um, which I've always, I thought, you know, that that's something that a, a, a trader, uh, I think, would say, and, and it's a, it's a right way of thinking about if if you're, you know, not being um, dogmatic about your investing, right? Which you can be, by the way. There's other, many ways to invest. Question for you though: In this market, how often have you found yourself making money and being right, if ever? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like sometimes, like you have a like, a core thesis and it like plays out and it like works. Like, yeah, I mean, like it's not. That's supposed to be taken. I, I think the idea of it is not like to be taken literally. It's more just like don't don't get like too caught up in the weeds of like why something should be doing it, especially if it's like operating differently, right? Like like the the market's telling you something, you should like right. probably pay attention to it. Versus like I'll say like one where we were like really wrong is like clearly like there was like mounting trouble in FTX like faster than we were like willing to like accept it, and like that was just like. Poor decision, right? Like that's like an, a counter example of it. It's like, well, you should like probably like pay attention to what's happening versus like what you think. I hear you. I guess with, when I when I hear the phrase, I usually think, um, I think of it sort of like in the context of like maximalism, for example, right? Do you want to? Are you putting being right? Uh, no, that's a great example, right? Yeah. yeah, that's that's taking it to an extreme where it's like you're you're letting some thesis or some thought that you have like override like what the market's saying. Yeah. Like, like, it's a great example. Like, like, clearly there's, like, even if you don't think, like, things have value, like, somebody else does, and, like, they're willing to, like, put money into it, or, like, trade it, or, like, you know, like, this, like, idea, like, everything else is, like, worthless, like, clearly, like, you're wrong. <laughs> clearly the market like, does like, like, you, like, maybe you're, maybe you're right in 50 years, but, like, it doesn't matter now. Right. I think a lot of people, like you said, Dan, have been proven wrong in this market, and I'm curious to know, um, we've seen a lot of players, a lot of lenders in particular going down um, because of the contagion from FTX's fall. Um, who else is going down? Like, how far do you think this contagion still has to spread? Um, how much more, like, how, how many more bankruptcies are we, are we, or should we all expect to see? Yeah. Well, I guess, like, the one thing is, like, there's not a lot of lenders left, right? Like, there's just, like, the reality of it. Like, I mean, there's, like, three, maybe, like, two that, like, actually do any real size. Um, I'm not going to like name names cause I don't want to like speculate, but like, I, I think we're like, we're just like running out of like mid tier venues too. Right. Like we, it's not that there's nothing left, but like we've almost like mathematically just like whittled through so much of it. It's like, there can only <laughs> physically be so many like entities left on the other side of it. So I think that's like the reality of it. Um, I'll fed not to just come out. I think just like ripped. Um, anyway, like that's like. I think the, the big thing, I, I think like the smaller and mid tier venues that like probably like have been like running like small fractional like issues for a while, like will probably just like resort to either like freezing certain like pieces of like business to like survive or like will just 
haircut people and like move on. I, I think that's like kind of like the reality of it. I, 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 would, I don't think there's any like big looming giant bankruptcy that's like waiting in the shadows currently. Yeah. Like, it, like, like, like who's left? Like who, who it's not Coinbase because everything's public. Like I just like don't think so. Right? I mean, I, like, I don't, it has like, to be like the, the, the like, big, the big scaries are, you mentioned Binance before and, and Tether, I, I would say are the sort of the main ones people are. Theoretically... Yeah. Tether, Tether has always been like subject to these concerns, right? Like that's something new. Right. Um, Binance would be like, finance would be the Armageddon. Like that's like, <laughs> yeah, that would really, that would really be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> like there's just like, like that being said, like they should be making a ton of money, but then I also thought that way about FTX, though. like, but also to a much bigger degree, right? Like they're much bigger. Yeah, they're so. much bigger, right? I mean, I think, um, yeah. no, and to be clear, I mean, I have no, we have no real reason to have any suspicions about Binance. We're just purely talking about its size. It's so massive um, that, you know, I yeah, feel like that's... we don't have any no suspicions of it. Like, I mean, that business like on a run rate, I don't know, like what is it making a year? I, I I would wager four billion dollars more. Like I, I mean, it's insane. That papers over a lot of mistakes. If you had any, even right, right. Um, speaking of which, let's let's uh, you know, we we've said that we have funds stuck on FTX. I don't know if you guys have come out and said, um, but it, but do do you are do are you are, are you on that uh, list somewhere that we've yet to see? Yeah, we we are. We we lost about fifteen percent um of like assets like. Mm-hmm. there the problem i like is like i don't know what stuff's like marked to like i don't yeah, know that, like mm-hmm. that was the same, I, have, I have no idea how that's, that's what like i was wondering calculated especially knowing that they had like no accounting department at ftx <laughs> according to john ray um no i agree they put out that list well, of the top you... 50 and and i was like i don't know you know i was like we don't know who's who's who on this list we know what we said we have and we see one that looks kind of like our amount but we don't know when they marked this or what assets these are well, you know, it was also funny is like we ended up with like a weird hodgepodge of things because um, the uh, did, did you guys do this too? Like where like th- there was a period where it shut off and then they hadn't like act like you knew you weren't getting out. Right. But you knew like they were going to file. And it was like, I don't know, you had like 48 hours to like try to lose as much money as possible as you could <laughs> on FTX. Right. Like, well, like it was you were putting on these like really weird trades where you're like, like the one everybody did was they were like long Solana on FTX, like shorted on Binance. Right. And you were just like hoping that when that big unstake happened, that it would like crash lower. So your liability on, but like we were doing all kinds of like weird stuff to like try to like trade out. So like we have a basket of like odd assets that like we were left with at the end. We're like, I don't know, like I guess <laughs> the dollar value of these, like, so we don't know. I don't know what like our actual like yeah. dollar liability is. Right. I, I don't think anyone does. And, and, you know, when thinking about you had like the Mt. Gox claims, right, which are still haven't fully played out. And I think everyone's assuming yeah. there will be like FTX claims, maybe even BlockFi claims now that they've filed. Um, but the problem, particularly with the FTX claims, is nobody has any idea what they are. Right. I mean, we don't even know. Right. What it is. <laughs> with, well, also, like we were we were like trying to see if like because like, withdrawals were kind of random. Right. Like towards the end. And it seemed to be like anything that just came in the door would then get like withdrawn. So like we were buying any spot asset that was on there and trying to withdraw it with like the hopes that like, I don't know, maybe somebody like accidentally like deposits a bunch of Algorand and then you can like withdraw And they like it, left right? Algo so withdrawals we like, on by mistake or in general or something. Well, it felt like withdrawals were just like on, but like there were just no assets. So like stuff would like oh, land and then it would go out the door. Well, it was weird at the end. Like, it the felt, last, it like, felt like that at the very end. Like... Of it was like strange. And any deposits you feel like were immediately turned around as withdrawals and the, the, they literally had nothing basically. Yeah. For a while, wow. it seemed like anything would come in and then like that would get batch sent out. And then they were prioritizing smaller stuff for a period. It seemed it was also, yeah. here's the problem. It was like really bad information, right? Like right. everybody was just like speculating. Like there wasn't like official correspondence. Mm. Like they weren't like saying stuff. And then like the Bahamas crap happened and everybody was trying to like, yeah, you mean, money through those accounts. And, yeah. There was the, uh, uh, Al God trading or whatever, like on on Twitter, was claiming that like he was getting out through like a Bahami Bahamanian like residence so, and stuff. So I don't know about that one in particular, but I like, do know that like people were withdrawing. Like you could, so the inner here's what happened. Like not because we're obviously following this a lot. Is like you could the internal transfer mechanism was still working, right. even though like there was nothing being withdrawn. Um, so like I could send to your FTX account, you could send to mine, right? Because they didn't post it on chain; it was just like inner. Right. Um, I don't know if you'd ever used it, but like on FTX, like there yeah. was just like an internal ledger. A lot of the exchanges do the same thing. So um, you could find somebody with a Bahamas account and you could be like, hey, I'll just like send you all my shit. You take 
and just like withdraw it because the withdrawals were coming out of the Bahamas accounts. They were allowing. So this went it. on for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So the Bahamas accounts were like getting to the front of the line. Um, and like Sam admitted this yesterday, like he like that actually happened. Like they turned that on because the Bahamas like government said that they didn't ask for it, but like Sam was like, "Well, I got to be in the Bahamas, so I did it." So anyway, <laughs> so that like was coming oh, out, God. but then like but then they shut the internal transfer mechanism off. Yeah. So what people were doing is they were like they were trading the NFTs to oh, like yeah. launder the money from like the oh, accounts to the Bahamas accounts. It was like it was a mess. Oh, it was God. such a mess. What a disaster. So anyway. Why why right. isn't Sam? We did in not we did not right partake now. in that, but uh, Dan, because why nobody it, nobody cares yeah, why, about crypto people getting robbed. You think that's why? Because only you know the I fraud I think that's a lot of it. Yeah, so the fraud, you know, we, we're pretty sure I'm gonna say alleged fraud, um uh, particularly in what we think happened. Our guest last week, Lucas Nutzi, who's um head of R and D at Coinmetrics, ran through a bunch of data that they have showing what they believe is the clear misappropriation of funds from the exchange to Alameda accounts. Um, so I, I, I'm comfortable, I think, saying that, um, you know, this bad behavior, um, you're saying because it only happened to crypto people, you think that's why there's not, uh, why this guy's, you know, appearing on deal book in a couple hours at New York Times and not in jail? And also, Dan, do you think that that really is the, the reason? Like what Lucas had told us last week was that a lot of these funds, like the $15 billion amount was because they were like gambling it away in very bad like, like DeFi, DeFi trade and, and like losing it in bridges. But like, is that your perception of why FTX fell as well? So I, I, I look, I don't know. I'm speculating and I'm sure like he's done a lot more in the on-chain thing. I, I think the hole is so big though, that it's not any one of these things in particular, right? It's like, it, it's too many different things that would have to like mm -hmm. make this up. Like it, it, it's very hard to lose $10 billion trading. <laughs> like it just is. And like, that's, that's a lot. Like there's a lot of hacks. No, like structurally, that's like a right. hard thing to do. So right. like, I, I think it was like, uh, I think it was a confluence of like a number of things that they had go, like they sent a lot of money at the door in venture, right? Like how much money did they allocate? Like, uh, like 2 billion or something. Billion? I, I think they pay. I, I think it's more than that. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot. So anyway, like, right. Like, so a lot of that goes out. That's a lot of your liquidity. Like, All those they ads. Obviously, like bought a bunch of, they, yeah, they spent a ton of money on the marketing. They bought a bunch of like property down there. They like lose some in like bridge hacks they like lose some in like bad bets like they lose some like doubling that like it's going to end up being everything like it's the only way you can get to the number being that large i think because you gotta remember they raised close to two billion too right like there's like a lot of money that right. came in the door so you gotta like account for that getting lost too and like they also like in reality should have made a ton of money on a lot of their bets right like they bought yeah the crap out of solana in the single digits like you had a year of that, like sitting above a hundred dollars. I know like, that's a bit, it should have been like a material P and L then. So anyway, yeah. like, I guess like, I'm not just like convinced it was like, it's going to be like easily explained as one thing. Like I, yeah. I'm of the opinion, it's going to be a lot of things. Yeah. And fair. I, and that's I, my thought on it, the coin. No, no, that's right. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And the coin metrics analysis does not account for the total size of the whole. It's not like, Oh, we found all 10 billion that supposedly is the whole. And they all were in DeFi. It was um, a lot of money, but not, not necessarily all of it. So um, that's, I, you're right. I mean, <laughs> this is maybe a good thought experiment. If you had to lose $10 billion in like 12 hours, like what would you do? Like you what, what's the you, trade? You, you, <laughs> you, no, you realistically can't. Like the yeah. answer is like, there's just not, like you can't do it. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could like, like not you know, in like trading. Yeah. Not in trading. I mean, like, you, yeah. Think about how far you'd move any market just trying to even like execute that. Yeah. Like let alone. Like, I don't know. I just like, I, I hear you. Like, I don't think that's like that easily losable. Um, I mean, so, you can lose a lot and it can <laughs> totally. it, but, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. I agree. I mean, something has to basically go to zero in short order um, and you have to be a huge size there. But um, on that topic. Yeah. Right? And like people, people used to say that people were like, that's the Luna thing. And like, they just ate it all. And it was like, the right. right like that was like, you're going theory for a bit, but the, the open interest on Luna itself, like wasn't ever that big on FTX. Like, it, like, even if they had eaten the entire thing down to zero, it wouldn't get you there. Right. In your history, though, Dan, I mean, in terms of your very large history of trading, what has been your worst trade? Was it Luna? I mean, what? Yeah, yours or what's like, even better? What's the worst you've seen? Oh, uh, like what's the, the worst? It? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got a couple this year. I mean, like, we did the Luna Treasury deal that cleared that. Oh, that you break. guys did? Yeah. Yeah, and it was worth nothing in June. So like rough. Like I mean rough time. So that's pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like that was a that was a very fairly um fast loss on that one. 
I mean, we were an equity investor in BlockFi. We were an equity investor in FTX. Like those are yeah. quick successions of zeros. Let me ask it a different way, Dan. Um, like what's the cringiest, uh, or, or hold on, how do I want to ask this? The, there's a lot of trades that have been consensus trades in crypto in the past, like historically speaking. Just one quick example is like, uh, you know, the ETH Classic or ETH POW like trading people were trying to do around the merge. Um, there's been many others. Um, you know, I'm thinking about like even, um, you know, trading around BCH and like various, you know, trading forks. Like, I don't know what, what can you think of like a consensus trade that everybody was interested in or, or even did that like was really bad that you that you saw in the past in crypto? Oh, so many. Well, I mean, there's some that you like knowingly knew were going to explode. I mean, like people make that argument about Luna too. So like, I mean, like, right. I'm not like trying to defend, but like the whole OHM thing was wild. Oh, the ohm forks. Yeah. And, like. Yeah. Well, no, just and home itself. Right. Like when that was like, and I was like, this whole thing is just like predicated on the fact that nobody will sell it. I was like, it doesn't like really, they're like, this is like a crazy like concept to like be building something off of. <laughs> so I like at the time when that whole thing was like going on, I was like, this is like outrageous. Uh, so like <laughs> that one like stuck out as like, I mean, <laughs> like remember when people were minting empty blocks of ETH and then selling them as NFTs? Oh like my that God. Was, I forgot like, about there that. There was a lot yes. of NFT moments where I was like, this is just, Outrageous. I think yeah. I remember when someone pitched me the idea of Ethereum as a diary, like the world's diary. Everyone would just put in an entry, like anyone could put in an entry into the blockchain and say, on this day, but I did this thing. And you can do that already, though. That's the crazy thing. I mean, it, it was like, it was like, you, yeah, like I, you get to own, <laughs> own a day, a day on Ethereum <laughs> forever. <laughs> I like, I mean, Steppen was pretty good. Step that was in. a pretty good time. Yeah. yeah. When you get paid, walk to earn. I thought that was pretty great. Were you, were I mean, you like, walking, were you like, walking to earn? I, no, I didn't even walk to earn. I should have, I should have picked up some pennies. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't even get into it. I just, I don't know. Some of the, I mean, some of the stuff's hilarious in retrospect. What about like, but uh, it had a lot of money. Like there's a lot of yeah. money flying around on this stuff. Yeah, but even even like um, you know, I'm thinking about thinking back. Like, okay, so here's a related question. Like, so you were at Circle. Uh, you guys were blowing up. I remember you were really big in 2017. Um, summer 2017 was the BCH fork on Bitcoin, right? That was uh, uh, um, when the block size wars sort of culminate culminated. Um, what do you yeah. remember from that time? I don't know. What was your view on that back then? Like, what was it like of trying to deal with forked coins at Circle? You remember that was the whole thing too. Like, Coinbase like didn't give them, and then was gonna get, and then gave them in December. Like, how did? What was your view on that though? Yeah. That, that was a pretty fun saga at the time. That was fun, and just to clear what you said earlier, we were definitely not the largest desk, but okay. like we were up there. Yeah. Um, I would say, looking back on it, I think Cumberland was probably the biggest at the time. But yeah. anyway, like, sort of sure. doesn't really matter. Um. Yeah, so BCH, like, we, we actually had pretty good color that, like, it was going to be valuable. Um, we tried to buy a lot of it before it actually happened. Um, so we, we were going out to, like, larger holders of, like, Bitcoin trying to, like, buy the BCH. But, like, people just, like, didn't want to do it. Um, and they, like, they either didn't care or they were, like, this is weird and, like, I don't want to get involved. So, like, we didn't need anybody to take us up on it. Yeah. Um, mostly because, like, we, we had a lot of people in Asia in particular who were really excited about it and also were trying to buy it from us ahead of time, right? So Got they it. were trying to be like, hey, I want to buy this, yada, yada. Um, so like we we were like, I think a little less dismissive. Like, so this was a very much like an East and West like market thing, right? Like it, in China in particular, like very much like going to be a thing. Like we knew like the miners out of there were like for it. Like obviously like um, Gian was like all over it, like pretty public. Like, so we, we, we pretty much knew that like there was going to be some tangible value to this, but in the West, like everybody was like, this is stupid. Like, why would this thing ever be like a thing? Mm. So like really like what we ended up doing pretty well on this whole thing, because like we were buyers of it for like some fairly good size, um, when the market opened and like sort of came out and we were able to like, leg out of that and like, we're basically bridging it, right? We were buying it us hours and then selling it back in Asia hours. The um the problem was like all the exchanges had inconsistent like right. dealings with it, right? So the first fiasco was we had to like we had to close everything um going into it. But one thing we did also is like this this was a time when um like OKX's futures were really big. Um and th what they would do is um the like the quarterly futures would settle into the index, but you wouldn't be on the hook for the fork. So we had also gone like, this is the thing Kevin and Galois was talking about with the ETH proof of fork thing, right. like the same trade. Like we were massively short the OKX quarterlies against spot. 
um, and like got a ton of BCH just like that, right? Like you naturally got the roll down and you got the fork for free on it. So like that was like another good like angle on it. Yeah. Um, that one was great because you could collateralize the Bitcoin short on OKX. So you had no liquidation, right? Cause it's like a Bitcoin collateralized future and OKX credited you the fork for your balance that you were holding to wow. collateralize it. So it was like, it was all like packaged inside. That's nice. It was good. The problem was, I mean, you had like OKX exposure, but like other than that, <laughs> like it was like a very good trade. So like we had had that on, like we got a bunch, but yeah, like everybody had to get everything off Coinbase. I think Coinbase like dro- like they brought their be- like uh, Bitcoin balances down like almost to zero. I remember like they had, like the ticker of like showing it all. People like, all pulled out that at that much. I, I didn't remember that, but it it doesn't surprise because the people people took a ton out. Yeah, they, but it was like good because it was like a a good stress test that Coinbase was like solid. Totally. Yeah. Like it like came up like in that's it. always good because it was like the, the knock on they were like oh like Coinbase was able to like eat this so um, they all handled so yeah, it differently though like, I remember looking into this a lot I actually did um you know when we were working on Bitcoin at Fidelity at one point I published an internal report on how all the exchanges and venues handled these for this fork really just showing that like there was no standardization at all like a couple of them I, I'm not going to name and I've also forgotten which but some people some exchanges sold the BCH and credited you Bitcoin or cash in your account Zappo did that right yeah I think so Zappo it gave you a button there yeah. was like a button to sell it but that yeah. was it like, that was yeah the exactly they you. Um, and Coinbase obviously they said they wouldn't do it then they changed their mind and then finally like I think in December they gave you your Bitcoin cash um and then, yeah, and it was like the most front run thing ever. It was. It, like such I, a I'm not going to accuse him of it, but I agree. I mean, you've looked at the uh, the, no, the I trading. Think, I, I think, think it was pretty well known. Even... There was a lawsuit. No, and people even sued them over it. I believe. Yeah, but like, I don't think it was nefarious. It just like, this is the problem, and like, this is the issue that these like exchanges always run into. It's like really hard to like do the integration work on a chain and like not have anyone find out. Right. Like, it's just like it's really hard. So like, it always ends up. Le- what they should have done in advance was just like when they decided they were going to do it and before they did any work, they should have just said they were going to do it. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And then like, all right, then you can like do it. And, and I think they do but this like, now, right. They're much more upfront now about like, yeah. Hey, these assets are in our queue to be reviewed for inclusion. And then there's yeah, another but it, step. It's like everything. It's like 95 <laughs> assets. And it's like, <laughs> what do you, <laughs> like we, we may list any of these things. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Dan, about the recent conversation around proof of reserves and exchanges um, using these like cryptographic Merkle tree proofs to to help I- increase the amount of trust that users have in centralized exchanges in like the aftermath of, of FDX. Do you think that this conversation, which is not a new conversation, um, is is going to be like materially helpful and impactful to making centralized ex- to increasing the trust around centralized exchanges? No. I, like this, like came up after Mt. Gox, right? It was like, yeah, it's, like this happens every time there's like a major hack. Like it happened after Bitfinex got popped. It happened after like Mt. Gox. Like, like people either like the people who are like largely like trading just like are willing to like eat the risk. Is I think like the reality of it. Um, and like retail users don't ask for it and don't demand it. So like it's not like it's it's not a it's not a make or break for an exchange doing it. So they just like don't. Um, and like, I, I don't think that's the answer people want to hear, but like, I bet you in six months, like we've forgotten about this and like, we're just like, talking about it again and like no exchange is doing it. I so scrap know. that report like, right. that I'm supposed to write no, it on we're, proof we're, of reserves. No one's going to care like, about it. <laughs> people have been yelling about this for 10 years and like, I know. I mean, OKX did it after Gox, I recall. And the CTO of OKX yeah. at the time was Cheng Peng Zhao, also known as CZ. Um, I remember. So yeah, previously um, a blockchain.com. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I mean, you know, I'm not sure. I, I agree, though. You're right. The natural fit. I think the only way it gets forced on most exchanges if, is if you do get a critical mass of exchanges doing it. And now you're the one exchange that, like, doesn't do it. And you just, like, look bad, you know, like. Eat, OK, I'll say this. Like herd uh, mentality. All right, let's say every other exchange except Binance is doing it. <laughs> Does that stop people from trading at Binance? It doesn't. <laughs> Uh, no, Binance has to thing. be on board. That's a good point. They have to be on board. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it helps. Like, <laughs> yeah. no, it's great if you're Binance and you do it and then you like bury 10 of your like smaller exchanges right. that you know are all like not doing it. Right. But yeah, I don't know. I'm skeptical. Like, I, and I, I do think, I think it happens if a regulator demands it. Yeah. I think that's like how it gets. Interesting. Um, okay. A couple other fun questions. Here's a weird one. Who's the most 
I don't know, underrated or um, even just the best trader in crypto? And and also as a caveat, why is it Justin Sun? Justin Sun might honestly be the best trader like in crypto. Like the man just like he just absolutely top takes it and he like absolutely bottom takes it constantly. I mean he right. like also creates the bottoms and tops. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, I how mean, big like, is that's he? a pretty I don't know. I would wager like four to five billion dollars if I had to like wow. guess. And yeah. I'd say like half that's trading proceeds and like half Goodness of that gracious. is like just Tron related stuff. Goodness yeah. gracious. What was the thing that they were doing yeah. with FTX? They they announced there was some way for people to get money off FTX if it was Tron. What was the uh, deal with that? Yeah. What was that? <laughs> was like, this is part of the like shenanigans you... during the whole like thing. Yeah, this was like shenanigan time. I he was like letting you withdraw Tron effectively. <laughs> So like if you had Tron on FTX, he would just like give you Tron elsewhere. Interesting. I think that's like how it would work, right? I think it was on Huobi. He'd be like, right, yeah. you get Tron here, like credited for like your Tron. But it, there's like rules, and there's like only a certain amount, and like only if you had had the Tron from like certain periods. Oh, so you couldn't like just I, go I buy Tron specific... in the defunct FTX exchange and then get out. You might have been able to do that, but like I don't think it like worked for size. It wasn't like a real thing, I guess. Mm. Like he's done this before. He did this like with OKX. When remember OKX froze everything for three right. months. I remember like, that was when uh, when uh, the the guy was in jail or or missing, right? Or not even in jail, he yeah, was star. missing. Yeah, it's a star. Yeah, he was missing. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if he ever. But this is like this is like the issue with some of these other exchanges. You're like, like everyone, like you forget real quick, right? Like, yeah. Like we're talking about how OKX is like a venue used now. It's like, well, like people got their money frozen for three months there. Yeah, because like he, the what he had a he was a multi sig key signer, I guess, and was missing. I I don't think we ever got the real answer. Yeah, I think that was the more idea. More likely I think. than not, like I think law enforcement told him to stop. And like was either shaking them down or was like asking to like look into something and like until they were done you were like not getting any money off the platform crazy i think like they never officially gave an answer though there was like never like a known reason why yeah and now we have poloniex like in some kind of strategic partnership is i think what will be called it will be said they're entering a strategic partnership everybody had said that that Justin's son was buying Huobi. that's what they had said because justin apparently right owns poloniex i believe he bought it yeah. from circle yeah um, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and then there were, I guess, room, I guess will be, I don't know if it was acquired or like some group out of Hong Kong technically bought it. And everyone was suggesting the rumor was that that was actually Justin's son and then both denied it. And then I saw like yesterday, what said, actually, we're entering into a strategic partnership with Poloniex. What do you, what do you think is happening there? Is that, you think that's a consolidation by Justin and his growing empire? Yeah, he bought it, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> it they, like it. they not officially say, yeah. They, they haven't, no, they kind of yeah. denied it. Um, I don't know why. I mean, it is. Like, I don't know. I think I think that one, like, you can take it at its face. Um, yeah, I mean, like, he just likes buying things that he, like, turns around <laughs> and uses them for others. No, he's good. Like, he's very good at yeah. what he does, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. Dan. He's, just, he's, playing, he's playing chess. How do you think Justin Sun got um, the tether? behemoth to print so much tether on tron yeah, like why the deal? is tron yeah, this, the this best one, this platform. one's actually really easy for a stable uh, yeah. he, so there's a 10 bips creation fee it may be a little different now but there used to be like we used to make a lot of tether back in the day right. at circle and it was like 10 bips deposit withdrawal fee which like isn't like crazy like that's just like how they made money on it like before like interest rates became real like now they make it that way but um so there was like a, a fee to create it justin would pay the fee if you issued it on tron so that was like so why. just issuing it for basically you could issue it there for free. Yeah. Yeah. So you could create it. it. And then and it works. I mean, I've also yeah. heard and then you like, got the exchanges to like put it on. Right. Like right. And it's also not bad. Like it's not like a it's not like a bad blockchain. Right. Like it works for like moving tether around. Well, and also like if you're if you're I always figure too. like, I mean, let's say it is even a bad blockchain, which it, it, I, I agree it functions. It's not bad. It's basically an Ethereum fork, to be honest, also. Right. Um, so it's easy for exchanges to integrate, but also for an off chain asset like dollars, in a, you know, or treasuries or whatever the stable coin is backed by. Um, the tokens themselves are really just sort of like liability tokens, right? So like Tether can just like, if something goes wrong on Tron, Tether can just like cancel and reissue them, right? I mean, it's not, you don't need like Bitcoin level security for, for an off-chain tokenized asset. Yeah, no, you don't. Um, and it's right. fast, right? People like it on exchange because it's fast. Yeah, it's quick. It works. Yeah, it serves the purpose. Dan, are your yeah. views on Tether relatively unchanged for the past like couple years i feel like you've told 
I, during like interviews or Twitter before that like Tether is reliable, you've been able to withdraw. Like, what are your thoughts around Tether now? And do you foresee the position of USDT in the crypto market infrastructure changing anytime soon? Yeah, so like my like my, my opinions on it haven't changed, mostly because like no information has led me to like feel differently right. about it. Like, it, I guess like the one thing you gotta like always handicap with this is like we were in the business of like creating redeeming tether like up until mid 2019, right? Like that's kind of like where it ends. And like I don't know how it like works now, but like there was a big depegging right when that first big crash happened on the back of three arrows. It went down to like 95 cents. Yep. And then they they redeemed. I don't know what it was. It was like ten or, or twelve billion. billion. It. it was like ten plus billion over only a few days, and they did redeem. Yeah, it, it was like two three billion, like bang bang yeah. bang, like every day. Yeah, and they did it. So like I don't know. Like I mean, that means a lot. Um, so that's a pretty good stress test. Like so, as far as I know, like redemption sort of like still work. Like I mean, like Tether's big. Here's the thing. Like I, Tether fills a market niche. And like will continue to. I think it's just much smaller than like the larger stablecoin market, which like USDC, BUSD now in like yeah. particular have like sort of like filled their like if you look at like their percentage ownership like of stablecoins, like it's basically been down. Yeah. Yeah. Um as like a function of the whole thing. Totally. But, like I, I don't know. Like I kinda I kinda think it'll always be like a big valuable asset. It'll just be like smaller in terms of like mm. proportion of like the total. I don't know. That's like how I continue to see it like so, playing out. Oh yeah. So so you you view the stablecoin market also just generally growing, um, and tether not maintaining uh, its market dominance of it, but still existing. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Any chance that tether, in order to compete, moves like onshore, like becomes a an onshore entity, like regulated. Oh, you mean they like come into the fold in the U.S.? Like, well, I mean, you know, given that the growth of USDC and like other stable coins could, could you know, really take off if, if regulators get on board too, like uh, any chance of that happening? <laughs> I don't think so. I think I, I think the people that run that and the connects are like a lot more like philosophically driven than meets the eye. Yeah. Um, hey, I did see you mentioned earlier uh, that there must have been some news, and I'm sure you've been seeing it too on your terminals, Dan, while we talk. But Powell, uh, Jay Powell said that a downshift is likely next month, um, but more hikes to come. I guess that means that we're going to see 50 bips instead of 75 at the Fed next month. Maybe um, he'll cut. Ooh. <laughs> you yeah. think? No way. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you but imagine? I, I, um, a man can dream. I know, right? Um, but so so that's why the market has been uh, looks like reacting very positively. Bitcoin's almost up at 17k again, and ETH is over. Well, yeah. yeah. BlockFi and Alameda stopped selling our coins. <laughs> well, yeah, they don't have any. They can't sell anymore. So, um, Dan, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Anything? Any any last things? You'd, any market insight or wisdom? Um, for what you're thinking about, you know, I, you know, congrats. And, and I'm very happy to hear that you said you were, you guys were a little beaten and bloodied, but certainly not broken. Um, keep surviving and, and any final words to tell our listeners? I think that's it. I think you're just kind of like, you're just waiting and making it out the other side at this point. How I think long, that's really Dan, it. Got... how long <laughs> is this bear market, bear market cycle going to last? Oh, I don't know. I mean, like I, man, I've been really wrong on this, but I don't know. I want to assume like back end of Q1 next year, like life comes back and it's like, like the problem is they're gonna have a lot of overhang, right? It's gonna be like a lot of legal yeah. bullshit for like mm -hmm. a couple of years, so that's gonna like drag. <laughs> I don't think you're gonna see like material like venture type like traditional investment for a while. Yeah, like you, just, everybody just kind of has to lick their wounds on that side. So I think you probably looking a year. Yep. Okay. Well, like, I don't know. I mean, like the, picking a bottom's hard, but I don't know. I hear I don't you. think it'll be that much worse. We'll, we'll check in with you then, Dan, uh, at least in a year. But until then, uh, thank you so much. Great to see you. Uh, Dan Matrzewski from CMS Holdings. Quick break for our listeners. Our poll from last week currently pinned to our profile on Twitter at GLXY Research. It read the judge in the FTX bankruptcy case ruled that the names of unsecured creditors to the exchange will not be released for now. When will we learn the names of users or entities with assets stuck or lost at FTX? Um, the vast majority, 56% of respondents said never um, or later than Q2 2023. Um, you know, only a small number of people think we're going to 32% think we might get it uh, before the end of Q1 2023. 
Um, no poll this week, but instead a call to action. Again, if you would like us to talk about specific topics or if you have ideas for guests, or if you yourself want to be featured on Galaxy Brains, send us a voice recording or an email, research at galaxy.com, or hit us up on Twitter at GLXY Research. Um, and that's all. Get back to us, and we'll we'll consider including you or, or your ideas on the show. Um, now back to the show. I'm here with Christine Kim again. What a fun interview with Dan. Uh, yeah. Enjoyed that. The guy has so much um, experience in crypto and uh, and just a unique view on the market. I like how to the point Dan is. Yeah. Clear, concise. That's what you find from a lot of traders in general. Really hard to be a trader and not be like pretty honest um, mm. with yourself at least. And then usually you find, um, you know, they're pretty honest folks and and you know because you got to live in reality if you're going to make money trading yeah yeah and also take your losses like a like a cool person i hear you, you know <laughs> you got i mean again you can't make money if you're lying to yourself in trading so um that was an awesome conversation with dan from cms um so really happy he joined us thank you dan let's talk about just a couple items um from the you know from the news week it's actually been a pretty busy uh time in crypto news even outside of ftx and and other contagion fallout type stuff um, I think the biggest story is Fidelity is finally launching their retail crypto project uh, product. So uh, at they, this was uh, said in September that uh, by November it would be launched. And I think today is what, November 30th? Um, and two days ago, on November 28th, on Monday, they said they were launching it and that the wait list uh, was now, uh, people were getting off the wait list and it was coming in. I saw... Um, our friend Matt Walsh from Castle Island Ventures uh, tweeted that he had bought Bitcoin in his Woo-hoo. Fidelity account. I guess all these market this all these market events for the last couple months did not deter Fidelity's resolve to get this retail service to its consumers. For is it f- just for Bitcoin and Ethereum? Correct. I think even right now it's probably just for Bitcoin, but it will oh. be Bitcoin and ETH, I believe, because they've also said that at Fidelity Digital Assets they'll be adding. Um, support for ETH and, and Fidelity Digital Assets is the back end provider here. So assume it will definitely be both. Um, I don't know if any else. Um, and and transfers aren't actually apparently um, enabled yet. So it's kind of like Robin Hood before they enabled withdrawals, right? Where it's like you can buy and sell, but you can't actually like send Bitcoin in or out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yet. like a, your own wallet. Yeah. But I assume they, of course, will add that. Um, at some point, right? There's a lot of, you know, it's a big company and they got a lot of, you know, AML, KYC, like stuff they got to figure out exactly how to do it at a retail scale. Um, Fidelity Digital Assets obviously supports wallet services in and out. So they have the technical capabilities. Mm-hmm. Um, but big congrats to Fidelity. It's been literally years in the making. So very, very um, happy and proud of the teams there, both at Fidelity um, Brokerage Services, the retail business, and also Fidelity Digital Assets. So big, big. Uh, congrats to those guys. Cannot wait to see what happens there. And a I agree. Rare, Undeterred. Um, yeah. A rare, rare good news in the <laughs> sea of bad news. Um, I feel like at any other time we would have been like, oh, this is going to be great for adoption. But uh, frankly, it, right it, now. It is going to be great. I think so. But yes, yeah. I know. it's it's uh, it, it. We're in a tough period. But, you know, things get built and launched in bear markets. Um, most of the stuff that ripped uh, this year. Uh, and last year was all post 2017 bull market stuff. Um, but I agree. Um, you know, we're look, we're like Dan said, you just got to survive in this market. Um, all right, Alex, hit me with the bad <laughs> news now. <laughs> so BlockFi, um, the, the, oh, dear uh, Lord. the lender, right? They, they filed, they did file for bankruptcy. Um, and in their first hearing, I think they're called, um, they did, they had a court hearing about the bankruptcy and they said that they're owed a billion from FTX and Alameda. That's a that's a big number. That would be a huge portion of what we think. Well, what did you expect it to be? No, I don't know. I just am saying. I just, um, you know, that's just a big number. And um, so, I mean, look, I mean, it, it's obviously not good news, right? But I guess um, you know, we're getting more clarity on. You know, we kind of knew this was happening, right? Because BlockFi had halted withdrawals and such uh, a couple weeks ago in the wake of FTX, um, and FTX is the one that had come to their rescue. Post uh, exactly. three arrows capital um, in in June ish, I think. So um, you know, if your rescuer itself goes bankrupt, it's not really a good sign. So here's one you might like though, um, Casa, my personal favorite um, of several good ones. Uh, Bitcoin collaborative custody multi sig uh, provider 
So it allows you to store your Bitcoin um, in a multi-sig setup in which Casa can hold a key, um, which is nice. It gives you some redundancy. That means they can't move the funds unilaterally, but if you were to lose one of your keys, you could collaborate with them to sign and retrieve your funds. Um, they're adding, they had been Bitcoin only, but they have just announced today that they're adding support for Ethereum. Um, I think it's really good. Where can you multi-sig your ETH easily? Hmm. Do you know anywhere? I mean, obviously you can go no. on chain and like build your own Gnosis vault or whatever, mm -hmm. but that's beyond, I think, the technical capabilities for you know most people. Well, I think most people use MetaMask and it's like a browser, in-browser wallet. I don't know of many ethereum activities or like ethereum transactions and people who use ethereum regularly right. that rely on like a cold storage wallet it's true um i feel cold storage, cold storage should wallet. be more widely well that's the thing right metamask i mean again i think you can set these up probably i'm not sure if you can in metamask but multi-sig is um extremely powerful for security and you know, for a lot of reasons gives you redundancy um so i and i don't know of many people that are are you know if you're on chain doing a lot of on chain stuff then you can't really have a bunch of Y y that stuff can't be in cold storage, right? Which is why. Other um, than remember that DeFi protocol that got hacked and it was because like four out of the five multi-sig holders, their keys were compromised. Yeah, that can happen. Um, so, um, but I think for individual custody, multi-sig is really a powerful tool. Yeah. And I use Casa for my Bitcoin, um, for some Bitcoin, and it's um, great. The UX is awesome. Um, I love the team there and I'm just, I'm happy and proud, proud of them because I mean, look, the, some of the Bitcoin maxis were like very upset, right? And they're like, oh my God, like it's not a Bitcoin only company anymore. It's like, guys, this is a custodian. Ideally, they're going to store anything I ask, let alone another crypto asset. I mean, in the long run, I mean, banks have literal safe deposit boxes. They'll literally store basically anything. Right? Yeah. I want my custodians to store anything and do it well, theoretically. Um, but also, look, they said it was for client demand. I mean, they has the of... lashback been that bad on Twitter from... I mean, it's like, you know, yes. Is that why you think Casa didn't include ETH for a long time? Like that kind of sentiment? Oh, no. I mean, they love Bitcoin. There's no doubt about that, right? Jamison Lopp is the CTO. He's probably one right. of the top three Bitcoin uh, content creators and educators in the world um, and separately as an, as an awesome person. But um, so, I mean, I think they just start with Bitcoin because they love Bitcoin and it, um, and it needs it. But I think, you know, the market... Their clients want other products, you know? I don't know how you can be upset about that. Um, so <laughs> congrats sense. to the CASA team. And actually, we're planning to have Nick Newman, the CEO from CASA, on this podcast, hopefully in the next month or two. So um, we'll ask him about that. And we can ask him your question. Speaking of Ethereum news, I also have a nice little Ethereum tidbit. Um, so we'll have to dedicate maybe a, a longer uh, discussion for this, but I'll just say right now that more information around Ethereum's encrypted mempool to protect user and user transactions and make MEV um, more equitable for the ecosystem and less damaging to the ecosystem. Um, more information about that mempool has been released by the Flashbots. So team. this would be a a, a private mem or encrypted uh, secret mempool, so that you could avoid as a user being uh, the victim of an MEV attack or whatever we want to call it. Or have is that yeah. the idea? So, well, so there's not actually very much about. <laughs> this um you mean mempool. very much information we don't know so yeah we, yeah well like there's not I, honestly like i think that was my main takeaway from reading the newest blog post about suave so this is the name of the mempool suave and it's being built by flashbots um even though flashbot says repeatedly that this is a product that they want the community like everyone to build together um it was my biggest disappointment there really wasn't that much information around the technical design so we don't really know other than the fact that this is going to be an evm compatible blockchain so an entirely separate network that sits on top of other blockchains. So not just Ethereum, but um, many different chains and that the participants, the market participants of the Suave chain will be able to execute like cross-chain transactions to extract MEV and some of those proceeds will be given back to users. Um, so I think this multi-chain concept was a really big 
um, was like very emphasized in this blog post versus when the idea of Suave was first introduced back at DevCon in October. Then, you know, the concept was that when users submit a transaction, um, the contents of that transactions don't need will not be known will not be revealed, which is why I was like, oh, you know, this is an encrypted mempool kind Got of thing, um, which I th still think it is. But again, I mean, it's probably too premature to even have this discussion on Suave now. Interesting, because though, but literally it was announced. Nothing is it's going to be important, right? I mean, anything that FlashBots puts out is important for the Ethereum ecosystem. Totally, yeah. Um, interesting. All right, one last thing. Coinbase Wallet, um, I saw they've delisted or removed support for Bitcoin Cash, ETH Classic, Ripple, and Stellar, and they said it was uh, it will be effective December fifth. They cited low usage for dropping <laughs> those coins. So RIP to Ripple and Stellar holders. It's about Cash. time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good riddance. Look, that's all we've got. Um, thanks again to our friend Bimnet Abibi for his market uh, color, um, and to Dan Matrzewski, uh from CMS Holdings, uh, an awesome guest, um, and to you, Christine, for joining as always. Um, that's all we've got for Galaxy Brains. So have a great weekend. Listen to Dan, right? Stay out there, survive, get through it to the other side. Um, and we'll be here next week. See you then. Thanks for listening to Galaxy Brains, the weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. If you enjoy the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. To follow Galaxy Research, sign up for our weekly newsletter at gdr.email, read our content at galaxy.com research, and follow us on Twitter at glxyresearch. See you next week.